This is a Hot Pie Media original. This podcast is brought to you by Creatures of Habit and their great tasting and convenient product, the Protagonist Oatmeal. It's an awesome blend of gluten-free oats, plant-based protein, vitamin D3, and omega-3 fatty acids to give you what you need, but really what you want. Let me tell you, this product is delicious and it comes in convenient packets that I can take anywhere. I've eaten it for breakfast, made it into overnight oats, and I've even had it as a post-workout meal. My wife literally stole half my stash the first week I had it, so you know it's got to be good. I love the protagonist, and you should definitely give it a try. You can purchase the protagonist at creaturesofhabit.com. That's creatures with a K, and use the code BLUEPRINT15, that's in all caps, BLUEPRINT15 to get 15% off your first order. So one version would be someone who really like tries to amplify like Lauren, like it's really important. Don't drink too much. Like that's one version. A second version would be to really sit down and write out what they are going to do, why they're going to do it, why that's important. That's, I mean, most of what I think about is applied to people Mm -hmm. rather than the self, but to take those ideas and to turn them onto the self the more one feels like they have internally committed themselves. And also the more they feel like they have shared these ideas with others, the more binding those thoughts tend to be. Hi, I'm Eric Corum and this is The Blueprint. I've spent my life helping Olympic gold medalists, NFL and NCAA athletes be the best at their craft. Now I'm taking that expertise and translating it into your life. This podcast is for busy professionals and household CEOs who care deeply about their family, career, and their health. There's an ocean of content to wade through, but I do the heavy lifting for you and distill cutting edge science, leadership, and life skills into simple tactics optimized for your lifestyle and goals. Lauren Nordgren is a professor of management and organizations at the Kellogg School of Management. Professor Nordgren's research has been published in leading journals such as Science and has been widely discussed in prominent forums such as the New York Times, The Economist, and the Harvard Business Review. In recognition of his work, Professor Nordgren has received the Theoretical Innovation Award in Experimental Psychology. Today, Lauren and I discuss his new book, The Human Element, and how we can remove the friction that prevents great ideas from gaining traction. We also discuss how to succeed when developing new habits. If you have a New Year's resolution that you want to accomplish in 2022, I really think this podcast is going to be valuable for you. But now, please take one second and hit the subscribe button on whichever listening platform you're joining us from, as this is one of the best ways that you can support the podcast. But before we get to my interview with Lauren, imagine a team of world-class coaches and scientists focused only on you. These experts know exactly what you need today because they know precisely what your mind and body are ready for. That kind of guidance is now available to everyone. AIM7 is a wellness app that provides custom exercise recommendations to improve the outcomes of programs and workouts you already love. It unlocks existing data from wearables and other apps to provide empathetic and scientific guidance that's perfectly in tune with your mind and body. Your team of world-class experts is ready to get started. To get early and free access to this exclusive program, go to www.aim7.com. That's AIM7.com and sign up now. There are limited spots available in January, so sign up now and reserve your spot. But now it's time to lean in and learn from the best. Lauren, excited to have you on the show today. Thank you for joining us. Oh, uh, thank you. It's great to be here. Um, I really love this book that you've written, The Human Element. I'm, you know, I'm now um, uh, a startup CEO building a tech product that's consumer facing. And so this is something I'm thinking about all the time. But in my former life as a coach, where I spent like 16 plus years in the NFL and college, you're all, if you're an innovator, you're always trying to get people to adopt new ideas. Why is it so hard to get people to adopt a new idea? And this is so personal to me because I, uh, like I'd always hear, well, this is how we always did it. Like, you know, like we won a national championship and did this and we're like, yeah, that was 10 years ago, different people, different time. So why is it so hard to get people to adopt a new idea? Yeah. Uh, and it's personal for me, uh, too, for 
uh, much the same reasons. You know, there are many reasons why. Um, you know, the one I might highlight to begin is um, it the idea of the act of embracing new ideas runs against human nature. I would argue. And the reason for that is because humans are hardwired to favor the familiar over the unfamiliar. So psychologists call the status quo uh, bias. If you're in marketing, you might call it the familiarity effect, but it's the basic idea <clears throat> that people naturally, intuitively, like all things being equal, favor what is known, what is comfortable, what is familiar over the unfamiliar, even when people see the benefits of that, that new, innovative, unfamiliar path. Hmm. Creatures of habit, comfort, you want the same thing that you had before, it's old faithful. Creatures of habit was, in fact, an alternate title for this book. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, you know, being a creature of habit isn't always a bad thing. It can actually no. be a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're trying to advance technology, um, you know, we've had this whole, you know, recent thing with COVID, you know, that's a whole nother idea that people are trying to get to adopt. Um, so what are the forces that are acting for or against an idea? Like what are these driving forces that are, you know, propelling something forward or pushing it back? Yeah. And um, yes, th this habits do service like so much of our human behavior. There are many, many contexts where it where it's highly adaptive and it serves us well. But we're also living in environments now where these these adaptive qualities can can lead us astray. And um, I mean, when it comes to what are the forces that uh, fuel an idea that push it forward, that give it lift. I mean, these will be familiar to everybody because these are the conventional things. So it could be uh, data and evidence, right? That's fuel. Like really anything that fuels an idea is anything that elevates its appeal or gives it uh, or heightens its attraction. So, um, you know, putting a new, if you're trying to get a new product into the market, putting a new, a new feature or benefit, right? That that's elevating appeal. Um, incentivizing it, uh, using, you know, what, what leaders and companies are doing is they're often, uh, ex sometimes it's facts and data. Sometimes it's emotional appeals, hand wringing, you know, maybe that's what coaches are doing very often, right. Imploring, uh, trying to excite passion, all of that. Those are the forces of fuel and marketing departments. Their job is to add fuel, um, HR departments, their job is to add fuel. Like that's the conventional side of, of this equation. The frictions, these are the forces that get in the way of progress. Um, and we tend to be much less familiar with them. Uh, and, and there are a number of reasons for that. But the first one we, we touched upon already, which is uh, the fact that people favor familiarity. And so that's a, an ever-present friction for innovators because what are what are you as the innovator trying to do you're trying to get people to embrace the unknown uh we call that inertia and that and that's a friction um another central friction is effort so most new ideas have some implementation cost like you got to learn a new system like i i don't know i'm using a boring old pc and i believe that a mac would be better it is. It's cooler. It just seems better. I am on board with you. I would like to be in that camp, but I'm not in that camp. And basically because there's an effort cost, like I cannot get my mind around what you would do without right clicking. Like, I just can't imagine a world in which you don't right click. And because I can't, and I know long-term it would be better, but just the cost of implementation is what's That's a holding big me back for you it is it is but think to me this like captures the the essence of this idea so well because apple does such a great job of of fueling their products mm -hmm. it's cool it's slick it's refined it's like i believe it's better but because of just a few of these little barriers and another big one is I will admit that when you see a presentation go horribly wrong for technology reasons, like at a, a big keynote, it is invariably because they're bringing a Mac to a PC party. 
<laughs> right. And they got, they got the converters, they got the things, but it's like those two, like learning a new system and like what happens at talks, that's what holds me back. <laughs> that's I've actually started when I have to go somewhere and do so. I actually bring my own Apple TV. Mm, see? Yeah. And just plug it right in and then you don't have to think about it anymore, but that's, so you have fuel. This like propels an idea. It makes it more attractive. It's what marketing departments are doing. It's probably what we're doing. Even when we try to sell an idea to our kids, our mm -hmm. friends, oh, ourselves, the, ourselves, but then there's these frictions and right clicks. Um, you know, the, oh, I've got to learn this new thing. Hey, I want to bring up something really mm -hmm. interesting. Have you ever heard of a product called Noom? Uh, yes. So Noom is a weight loss app. Mm -hmm. They broke every rule in the book when it comes to onboarding. It used to be five to seven years ago. If you weren't into an app within three to five clicks, you're dead. Noom has 55 screens mm. to go through. And they've quadrupled their income. There are well over 300 million in annual reoccurring revenue now. Yeah. And they use that in a very sophisticated way, yep. even though it's friction to fuel belief. Um, so sometimes those frictions, I think, could become fuel, couldn't they? Yeah. And so there is a really interesting... Uh, uh, dynamic between fuel and friction. So very often things that um, I'm working with a company right now doing a kind of fuel and friction analysis. And you know, one of the things we often see is when it's when an idea isn't getting traction, they they keep trying to refine it. They keep adding bells and whistles and other elements. And if you come to this product though as a as a newbie, all of those all of those new features and benefits that fuel serves as friction because now it's just it's it's overwrought it's over it's been overcomplicated um but the uh, the opposite can also um be true particularly in the right context like it's not the case that we don't um you know always avoid effort Effort can make an idea more satisfying. It can signal our commitment to that idea. It can be a really powerful sorting tool, right? Like the fact that I have to go through all of these steps in the right context, it might um, signal even sophistication, uh, rigor, like it could have all those signals. So I think what it speaks to is uh, you can't, it, it's not a, simple analysis when thinking about the the dynamic or the equation between fuel and friction um but but a, a another case of this that i'd like to highlight is um you know one of the other frictions you that i think is often the most powerful is what we'd call emotional friction and so if you think about the adoption of uh tinder and so like the first generation um, online dating platforms like Match, eHarmony. eHarmony is another many, many steps. And for a lot of those people, I think it serves a similar function. Like the fact that it's not a superficial analysis, it's a deep analysis. That wasn't, even though it was effortful, it was engagement. It wasn't like a barrier. Because you're thinking like, wow, I'm really going to find that match. Yes. Yeah. But uh, Match and eHarmony lost to Tinder because for another reason, I would argue, which is there are a few frictions there. One being people feeling forced or pressured to get, which is what we would call reactance, but more importantly, uh, rejection. So the interesting thing about match, like, so when we've talked to match users, the thing they will describe again and again is, so you go through this whole process and for you, it's fun. It's engaging. It, it represents promise and possibility. But now you find someone who checks every single box and then you craft this perfect email, you send it, and then you start hearing replies like, uh, you're too short, you're too old, Ugh. I don't date Republicans or whatever, uh, or worst of all is you don't hear anything. And that system is laden with a lot of rejection, which is an emotional friction. And the really interesting thing that Tinder spotted that friction 
And they found a very clever way to help remove it, which is the process of mutual matching. Right. So in in the in the first generation platforms, it's in essence a one way street, right? Like you have to put yourself out there. Mm -hmm. You have to knock on someone's door saying, "Hey, I like what you're about," and you're giving these this person an opportunity to say yes or no to you. Mm -hmm. It's not that Tinder doesn't involve like all online dating has the potential for rejection at some stage, but the fact that the way that system works is you sort through people that you're interested and not interested in, and you're only paired with people who are mutually interested, mm -hmm. it's a way for you to only like, it removes that one way street. Mm. And because it found that, you know, like that wasn't adding more product features. It wasn't bells and whistles. It wasn't refining the look and feel. It was really understanding, you know, what's the emotional barrier for people either getting on or staying on and finding a way to remove that barrier. And all of a sudden, Tinder and its sort of second generation set of competitors really took flight. Mm. That's super interesting. Um, I would have thought it was other reasons uh, as part of the, I've never used Tinder. Actually, I never used a dating app. I was kind of right. I mean, it was happening, but I was a little bit before that. Um, that's really, really interesting. So um, how do we identify friction? Like what's a process that we can go through to be like, Hey, Cause I, I look, I'm a parent. I'm thinking about this in a lot of ways. I yeah. want to, I want to help my kids adopt, um, really healthy habits or healthy lifestyle choices. Um, whether that's the way that they treat other people or how they treat their bodies, et cetera. Uh, or, and I'm also thinking from a business perspective, um, how do we identify these friction points? Like what's a process somebody can go through? Yeah. Um, uh, there are different levels of analysis that one could do. Um, at the easiest level. So I think the good news is, you know, what, one of the central ideas we're trying to put forward is that people naturally think in terms of fuel. It's what we'd call having a fuel-based mindset. And if you just start shifting your attention to friction, all of a sudden people can often start spotting them. It just, it's, we have a blind spot for it. So if you shine a light on what you're not naturally seeing, oftentimes these frictions are on the surface. I think a great thought experiment, and I will say another, I think a great rule is frictions are best dis disarmed before the work begins, like anticipating frictions, like building our ideas, our products with frictions in mind, I think is a much more powerful and effective technique than launching ideas, realizing the handbrake is, is on, and now trying to figure out what do we do about it. Um, but I think a great thought experiment is, uh, is to ask yourself, let's assume that people like the idea. It's an appealing idea. What would be the reasons or barriers that people wouldn't embrace this idea, even if they like it? Mm. And I find that simple thought experiment is a great way to start shifting people's attention towards barriers and frictions. Um, but it is also true. So, um, and, and I have free materials. If you, if you go to our website, you, you can download them that helps people start diagnosing the frictions in their ideas and hopefully building more aerodynamic uh, ideas and innovations. Um, but part of the challenge with seeing friction is... So fuel is all about the idea itself and friction often requires that we move our attention from the idea to the audience. Mm. So it requires that we know them, that we know that context. And that's the other way. If you want to start thinking about how do we understand friction, you know, another really important question to ask is how well do we understand the people we're trying to serve how well do we understand, like, in essence, the user journey, the experience with the idea, because the frictions are, aren't about the idea itself. It's about the, the, the context in which those ideas are enacted. Mm. That makes so much sense. So how do we find fuel that's appropriate? Like, how do we find, I guess you, if, if, if people are always thinking about the idea, maybe fuel is just innate, but like, is there a way to identify like this fuel is really good fuel? <laughs> like this is not mm. the irregular, this is like the supreme fuel. You know what I'm saying? Like this mm. is where you should double down if you're going to, if you're going to engage with fuel. 
you know, it, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I don't. Um, so our, um, our argument would be that, that that's what people have good instincts around. Okay. And so our argument is not that you don't need fuel, like fuel is necessary without it. Your idea is inert. Like if people don't see the appeal, if it's not incent- it, like all of those things, if they're not there, then your idea isn't going to get off the ground. Um, so the, the, the metaphor that I find really useful here is people's intuitions about a bullet. And so this is a question we've been posing to people. Um, you know, if you think about a bullet, it's, it's pretty extraordinary because it, you know, it breaks the sound barrier. It can, it travels at, you know, depending on what, what we're talking about two, 3000 feet per second. It's incredibly accurate at an incredibly long distance. And it does all of that while also being a very simple technology. And when you ask people, what is it that allows a bullet to achieve such extraordinary power and precision, the reflexive intuitive answer, the near universal answer is uh, gunpowder. And, and that's not a wrong answer, right? That's a perfectly reasonable answer. It's also a perfectly inadequate answer. It's a reasonable answer because gunpowder is what causes the extraordinary exit velocity of a bullet. Uh, But the reason a bullet is able to perform, the reason it's able to fly so far and true is because it's aerodynamic, right? It's been optimized to reduce the principal friction operating against it, which is drag or wind resistance. And in fact, it's a nice example of if you just start adding more gunpowder, you just start adding equivalent drag against the bullet. So the magic of that performance is equally about making it aerodynamic. And that's what we are really trying to turn people onto. Like the gunpowder is essential and uh, there will be better people to talk about what's the right kind of fuel or gunpowder. What we want to introduce to people is, is giving, is give equal attention to the aerodynamics of the idea. And that's, we would argue, like when most people launch something, they've thought a lot about the engine and not about the aerodynamics. High performance isn't just reserved for elite athletes and those with unlimited resources. In my free newsletter, Adaptation, I provide you with curated information and resources to improve your health, well-being, and performance. I cover topics like sleep, stress, exercise, nutrition, and mental performance. You can sign up today for this free newsletter at ericcorum.com. Now, back to the show. That makes a lot of sense. I know with the, with the product, the company I have, AIM7, I've really harnessed in, okay, these are busy people, mm. okay? Busy, busy people. And so when we talk to our designer, this guy's really good. It's like we've tried to make it so simple. Mm-hmm. Like you go in and like, you know, it says get exercise recommendation. It's like, boom, click this thing. Boom. I got what I wanted. Right. There's, you know, and one of the things I've learned, like when you're pitching an idea is everybody wants to talk about how complex the idea is. Oh, but there's so much more to it. There's so many layers to this thing. Da, 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 da. That's just like, I guess, drag, right? What's the simple art of like what it is? I remember you ever see Dropbox? They're like one of their first decks. I think the one they got on the Series A. It's like there's a storage problem. They show this room just with crap everywhere, and it's like, wouldn't it be great? Like you immediately got the idea. Oh, yeah, okay. We're literally going to put this in this thing called a cloud, and you can just store it and pass it along anywhere. Now you can get rid of those little zip drives that everybody used to carry around on their keychains, right? So this makes a lot of sense that um, you've got to think about who you're dealing with. Dropbox was dealing with people that wanted to share files and they want to share them in a convenient way and they didn't want to have to carry their zip drive with them everywhere they went and they could send it to somebody else. Okay, so let's make it really click. Click on this, open this up, pull it, and you're done. Yeah. Makes so much sense. So how do we... I don't know. Is persuasion a bad word to you? Oh, uh, persuasion is a beautiful word to me. Okay. Um, who's your mentor? Um, I've had, I've had the great, uh, fortune of having a number of, um, of, uh, really important mentors and all academics. Uh-huh. Uh, so I don't know what their, 
what the reach would be to your uh, audience. A guy named Op Dijkstra House is a really influential psychologist. Um, some really important people in the health world. Um, a guy by the name of uh, Alex Rothman at University of Minnesota does a lot of uh, health and performance stuff. That's someone that comes to mind. I, I was just wondering if there's anybody in that in that pipeline of of persuasion because you know people. I think we think of persuasion, we think negative, like you're going to get sold something, right? Like mm. the negative connotation of, ah, oh, I went to the car lot and I got this car and I paid too much and now I feel like junk, right? But persuasion can be, I have a question written down. How do we persuade ourselves to act in our own best self-interest? Mm. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, if you, a fuel based approach to creating change is to push mm -hmm. a friction disarming and aerodynamic approach to creating change is, is to do the opposite of pushing. And I think if there's one rule of, of persuasion, um, of behavior change, it's not to tell people what to do. It's to allow people to self-generate the beliefs you want them to hold. Wow. Right? We are most powerfully persuaded, not by ideas that are fed to us, but by ideas that we arrive at ourselves. It's one of the reasons why the Socratic method is so powerful, right? Because Socrates is using questions to lead people to an, an inevitable conclusion, but they reach that conclusion on their own. They come to that inevitable conclusion it is not uh it is not through rhetoric or debate forced upon them okay so how do you do that okay we're talking about ourselves right so i want to persuade yeah. myself to show some restraint during the holidays enjoy myself when i'm with my family but like let's just keep that to you know saturday night party with a friend. You know what I'm saying? So you don't have the end of holiday, January 2nd, like, oh my gosh, look at my belly uh, yeah. type of a thing. Um, how would you apply the Socratic method to persuading myself to arrive at that conclusion? Would it be like asking myself how I feel? Usually feel January? I'm not, this isn't, this is a hypothetical, Eric, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you know, uh, two ideas would come to mind, um, both kind of what I would call friction based. Number one is it is not about psyching yourself up for this. Mm -hmm. uh, number one, it is about removing the barriers for you doing what you want to do. I think that is step number one is figuring out how do I make this easier? Um, and that's very much a friction based rather than a fuel based approach. Um, and if that means, uh, if that means removing you know, th this would be like either the person who only brings a certain amount of cash to the casino, mm -hmm. like that's creating, that's using friction intentionally. That's creating barriers to hold people to a certain path. Um, the other approach, what you might consider the more kind of long-term transformative approach is uh, you would, I would want the person to self-commit themselves to this course of action. And so what I mean by that is, you know, what we do, what we believe ourselves to be, people feel a, a tremendous pressure to be internally consistent. Hmm. And if you, so one version would be someone who really like tries to amplify, like, you know, I, Lauren, like, it's really important. Don't drink too much. Like that's one version. A second version would be to really sit down and write out, um, what they are going to do, why they're going to do it, why that's important. That's, I mean, most of what I think about is applied to people mm -hmm. rather than the self, but to take those ideas and to turn them onto the self, the more one feels like they have internally committed themselves. And also the more they feel like they have shared these ideas with others, mm. the more uh, binding those thoughts tend to be. It's really powerful for this time of year is, you know, a lot of people are starting to look forward, right? 
They reflect on what happened and they start looking forward to what could happen, what could be. Um, and if you want to take action, I think, you know, you, I think this idea of self committing and really taking the time to reflect on why, why is this important? You know, the five whys, like you just keep asking, keep asking, keep, well, I want to lose some weight. Well, why? Well, I feel like I'm sluggish. Why do you feel, you know, why do you feel sluggish? Well, at the end of the day, I don't have any energy for my family. Oh, okay. Well, why is that not good? Well, because my kids don't get the best of me. Neither does my spouse. All right. So you really want to be better for your family. Yeah. Okay. Now you've hit something deep, right? And so it's not just, I want to lose five pounds or 10 pounds. It's like, I want to be better for my family. And so you're connecting, um, you know, you know, the fog school at Stanford. So it's like connecting. Well, actually this isn't from him. A good friend of mine, Dr. Peter Haberl, he's a senior sports psychologist for the USOC. We've developed as part of our thing, we uh, values based decision-making. So he's always like, you know, when you work with elite athletes, everybody wants to win the gold medal. But when you can link your values to those actions, now when you don't feel like training, you don't feel like doing something difficult, you're like, because I value X or because I value my family, I'm going to do Y. Is that kind of right? Like, yeah. Okay. And, th- and so this reminds me of, uh, uh, this is, you see application of this, it's called guided interviewing. And maybe this is an approach, you know, but if you, so take, um, uh, drug addiction, mm-hmm. um, one particularly effective technique for getting people to say, enter rehab is you ask the uh, person with addiction. Uh, I call that person an addict. I know that's not, there's whatever the appropriate term is, the person struggling with substance abuse. Um, What the counselor might say is imagine a scale of one to 10, 10, meaning you are a hundred percent committed to sobriety in this moment without reservation. No second thoughts. One is the exact opposite. You're ready to descend into this as far as it'll take you without reservation. Where are you on the scale of one or a 10? Now, uh, addiction is inherently ambivalent experience. Nobody is a one or a 10 on these things. Uh, What the person, the uh, the person with struggling with addiction might say is they'll generally say something like a, a three two, three, four, something like that. And that's precisely what the counselor is looking for because it leads to the hook, the second question, which is, um, that's interesting. Why aren't you a one? Mm. So what does the person now begin to do? What the person now begins to do is they begin to self-generate benefits, arguments they've seen for sobriety. And that's the first step of leading people towards self-persuasion. And you could imagine how you would take that technique to apply it to oneself, where the question isn't just about like um, trying to recommit oneself. You might really start to write down what are, why is this important? What are the benefits you see? What are your arguments? What are... The deeper that analysis and the more specific and concrete these commitments are, the more people will feel bound to those commitments. So I think it's an interesting, both at the one level, it's really understanding the, that deeper why and committing oneself to it. And at the other level, just as powerfully, it's understanding the most superficial level a practical implementation implementation problems. And here, what I would consider is what you might call like backward mapping, where you really start with the outcome and you try and think through what are all the barriers that are going to get in the way. So if it's like, I want to lose um, five pounds in, by you know February 1st, then you might say, well, how do I get there? Like, how am I going to implement that? And you might say, okay, I'm going to replace the Chipotle burrito and substitute it with an apple. Um, you know, excitement, motivation, fuel isn't the thing that's going to get in the way of that plan. Like very practical impediments are going to get in the way of that plan. So then you might say, okay, well, where do I get my apples every week? Um, 
maybe that they're not at my work cafeteria. So I need to pick up apples. What day of the week do I do that? Maybe it's Saturday. Okay. So if something arises on Saturday that gets in the way, what is my plan B? Like, it, uh, motivations, goal scholars would call that forming implementation intentions. Mm-hmm. And a huge part of that is trying to proactively identify barriers. Think about what are my workarounds when I encounter those barriers. And all of that is very much in the spirit of figuring out how do I build a more aerodynamic um, plan. Wow. I really like this. This is really good. We call it reverse engineering in sport. So we would just reverse engineer the outcome that we wanted. We want to win a gold medal in four years. Okay. What are the things that need to be done? How many, you know, and how are we going to make this become to a realization and training and the psychological preparation and all this kind of stuff. But if you want to map back from the outcome that you want, it's really not about motivational let you down. You know, mm-hmm. I, I don't know if you agree with that or not, but I do. Yes. Um, yes. A lot of people are like, I got to get motivated. I'm like, look, I've worked with the best in the world. <laughs> that is not like what drives them. There's this deeper, deeper thing. Cause there are days you do not feel like doing it, mm-hmm. but it, it, to your point, if you've removed all the friction, action becomes so much easier. Yeah. Um, Man, this is really phenomenal stuff. I thought your book, by the way, was masterful. Like it was just very, it's somebody that's really into this. I mean, you can, I'm just opening up. I got all these like highlighted dog-eared pages. Um, I I was thinking of different ways that I can use this for myself, for my company, for my family, but uh, the human element, why did you name it the human element? Because it was before it was fuel and friction. Why'd you end up with the human element? Yeah, it's a um, great question because what, what we're trying to capture is, you know, there are a lot of books about influence and, and innovation and, and entrepreneurship. What we are really trying to capture is the human side of the equation of bringing new ideas to life. So m- most of the books on how do you, you know, breathe change into the world is really about positioning of the idea, the marketing of the, it's about the idea itself. What we are really trying to uh, we're trying to raise awareness, focus people's attention on the the. There's a very human side of this process, and it's why so many good ideas just never get off the ground. Isn't because there isn't good data for it. Um, a lot of great ideas are unquestionably good ideas. There are these psychological impediments that are getting in the way, and that's what we are um, trying to cast a light on, and therefore the human element. I think, and you cast a really good light on it. It's a really, I hate to say, I don't want to use the word simple read, but it's, mm. it's, it's, it's approachable. Does that make sense? Uh, that's, that's high praise for me. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I really, I, I think that if you, if you're somebody that, you know, maybe has, you know, for work, your job is to move things, progress things forward, champion new ideas, or if you're trying to create behavior changing yourself or, you know, you're maybe you're a parent or something like that. And even in a spouse, you know, or, or a partner, like it's really important that you're understanding what are the frictions that are going on there and how to lower those things. Um, you should definitely get a copy. You can get it on Amazon. We'll put it in the show notes so people can just scroll down and, and click on it. But Lauren, Thank you so much for being with us today. This is a phenomenal discussion. Um, I really appreciate the work that you're doing. And as a scientist myself, I'm looking forward to seeing more papers and literature that you're going to put out. Oh, this is a blast. Thanks so much. If you enjoyed today's podcast, then you may want to check out episode 53 with Matt Wallard. Matt is an expert in behavior design, and he formerly ran Microsoft Ventures. In this episode, Matt outlines the simple science of how to influence behavior for the good. Thanks for joining us today, and I'll see you soon. Thanks for listening. You can find more episodes and all of our other Hot Pie Media originals baked fresh daily at our home online at hotpiemedia.com, the Hot Pie Media YouTube channel, or wherever you listen to podcasts.